I call to order the virtual study session of the Lakewood City Council on April 1st, 2024 at 7.02 p.m. Good evening, everybody. To connect with the City Council meeting, please use one of our following links at lakewoodspeaks.org or lakewood.org slash council videos. So tonight, our topic, we have a study session this evening that will cover two different topics. First will be current school safety, and secondly, traffic and safety on our streets. For online public comments, you may post comments of any length on liquidspeaks.org. That's our online forum for public comments. We are leaving that forum open this evening and through 10 a.m. tomorrow for any comments related to tonight's presentation. Want to make a quick note that um, though Lakewood Speaks usually reflects how many counselors have read all of your comments, we are reading them, um, but the system is not correctly picking that up as such. So our city clerk and IT departments are working on that to get that corrected. Um, in the meantime, we'll go ahead and begin our meeting. And with that, will the clerk please call the roll? Sorry, Mayor Strom. Here. Cruz. Here. LeBier. Here. Lo. Here. Mia Guerrero. Here. Nystrom. Here. Over. Here. Ryan. Yes. Charzai. Here. Sinks. Here. And Stewart. Here. Mayor Strom, you have a quorum. All right. Thank you very much. And our first topic of the evening will be on our current school safety. And I will go ahead and for that, hand the floor over to our city manager, Kathy Hudson, to introduce our speakers. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Strom. So it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our chief of police, Chief Smith, who has a special guest this evening, and that is the security chief for Jefferson County School District. And we're really excited to get to meet him. And his name is Jeff Pearson. So with that, I'll introduce Chief Smith. Can you hear me first? Yes. Thank you, City Manager Hodgson. I appreciate you uh, welcoming me to the board. I love to interact with our standing fathers of the community, but um, I can't see my um, PowerPoint on there, but I'll, I'll initiate this by saying greetings, Honorable Mayor Strom and our esteemed Lakewood City Council. And our subject matter tonight is gonna to be active school shooters and our Jeffco schools. And it's gonna be presented by my guest out there in cyberspace, Executive Director Jeff Peterson of the Jeffco schools and myself, your police chief, Philip Smith. I can't see the slides. We're supposed to be doing some slides, right? Can you make it? Yeah, let me go ahead and share uh, the, the presentation, Chief. Thank you, sir. Um, I appreciate you, Jay, more than you know. <laughs> thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. And there and there. How about that? That's Everyone great. see that? So the first slide is obviously just what I just spoke about. And if we could go to slide number two. That's slide number two. Yeah. Are you seeing them advance, Chief? No, no, I'm looking still at the active shooter one, but I have mine. <clears throat> Is it? I just want to be in sync with the uh, with my audience. Okay, so just to give you a historical basis, I'm not going to read through this. Obviously, Columbine was one of the biggest pivotal moments in law enforcement back in 1999, the most <laughs> horrific incident. As a matter of fact, in about two and a half weeks, we're going to have one of the a most distasteful anniversary of when that event took place. Um, 
it's an oddity, but when I was in my advanced program, I also wrote a college paper on the Columbine incident because it did, in fact, change police tactics when we deal with active shooters. Um, next slide, please. There you go. Slide three. Thank you. I'm going to defer to my esteemed partner, Jeff, as he wanted to jump on this. Uh, I'm still showing the historical basis uh, slide. Let's see. Jeff, you out there? Jay, can I, we put the <clears throat> slideshow in presentation mode? Oh, yeah, I thought I was in presentation mode. At least, and maybe we're seeing a different one of your shared screens, but for us, it's not in presentation mode. At the at the very bottom, there's a button you can click as well. Right. Down. Next one over. Oh. Oh, this guy. Yeah. Um... Yes, yeah, sorry, I just got like too many screens going. I've got my uh, slideshows or slides here with me if you want me to start while they're working on that, Chief. Sure, I, I've got it up on my side as well. I just wanted them to stay with us, but. I believe you had an interest in this slide. <laughs> I did, obviously. And, and first of all, good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, awesome to be here with the amazing city council. And I would say the first thing I would say is thank you. Thank you for your support at Jeffco Schools um, for providing us with SROs. And I think the partnership that we have through our MOU and through you and the, and the support you have obviously uh, puts us in a place where we can we believe that our schools, our students and staff are completely safe. And I think tonight we're going to talk a lot about why we believe that and some things that have changed over time. So once again, thank you. <clears throat> I think in this uh, slide we talked about, uh, Chief talked about the changed police tactics, but we changed a lot as a school district as well. Um, Columbine, of course, uh, initiate a larger response, I think, not just from law enforcement, but from schools to think about, you know, how are our schools safe? What can we do to improve those, um, the, the safety response measures? And when I think about, uh, we, we've added driver's license readers uh, is one component. Uh, as, as you've heard, the bond, thank you voters for the bond that came through a few years ago, we've added secure vestibules to every one of our schools, which means anybody that enters our buildings, we can have a secure um, de facto that says, hey, when you're there, we're gonna decide whether you come into our schools and it's a, an improved visitor management opportunity. Additional camera installations to give us intel. We don't have the personnel to watch cameras all day, but that intel uh, gives us a, an understanding to partner with our law enforcement agencies should something come down the road. Uh, we do frequent door checks, as you know from Uvalde and some of the other tragedies that have come, come about. Those doors that don't get shut, that get propped open, get left op open, those are additional security measures that we've put in place as a school district, limiting access to our campus when possible. We have visitor management systems in place now that we basically say, you're welcome to come to our schools, but in, in, in the past, they used to just come and go. It was more of a free-for-all. Now we limit who comes, when they get to come in, and we manage those individuals as they come to any of our buildings. In addition to that, I think the prevention piece We've really worked hard. I come from an, uh, an educational background. Father's a former law enforcement, but I bring that prevention side of the of the environment to the school district. And when we talk about mitigating incidents, we do that from a prevention lens. And I think Columbine sent us the message that we've got to take things serious from all of our, our kids and anything that comes forth. Uh, we're going to miss red flags or they miss red flags down the road from some of those other events. We take all those things very seriously. So when you think about police change tactics, we as a school, I believe, have, have improved, and, and we've taken our tactics to a new level from a school lens when it comes to school safety as well. Chief Smith? I'm going to go to uh, slide four. I'd say you're a tough act to follow, Jeff. <clears throat> the uh, slide four is basically a summary of the, the way our tactics have changed. There is no more of this incident command system, which is used to be prevalent. You set up a perimeter. You establish a command post. You have a staging area. That takes too much time. The, uh, the new rule is, is that you engage immediately, and that is what Lakewood focuses on annually and out of the academy as well. But the, uh, you will engage them immediately, and you see on the last line that 
The reason why they do engage them is because it draws the shooter away from victims um, and they either take themselves out or they engage the officer. But there is no waiting around anymore. Nobody's sitting outside a perimeter. That was some of the questionable actions that happened in Columbine, but they didn't know and they didn't have a different perspective on it. They knew it was active shooter. You set up a perimeter, but these people inside the building are taking as many people down as they can. <clears throat> so slide four is just a summary and, um, it, you know, basically since 1999, tactics have changed. If you're a current police department, you've been on this planet and you've had your eyes open, and your ears open, active shooters do not, pro you do not do an ICS system. No more. Can we training. try to get this? I don't see the slide. Can we yeah. try to get that up? Sure. It's, uh, well, <laughs> I can't get that? it for you, counselor. <laughs> Jay, <laughs> is that? Jay, Jay, can you put the slide show back up, please? How about now? Can you guys see? Slide four? No. What is going on? Okay, I don't think you're sharing screen anymore. Yeah, okay. There. There it is. Sort of. Wow, I think I completely closed it. How about now? Can you see it now? <laughs> Got like a form screen. You um, you only have this first one. Yeah, you're sharing the presenter view with us. I think you need to switch. The, there it is. There you go. Got it. Sorry about that. So that's a that's a basically a summary of uh, how things have changed. And go to slide five. The next slide, please, Jay. It's this is the Lakewood preparedness for school shooters. Um, what most agencies have adopted is the advanced law enforcement rapid response training model model, which was originated at Texas State University. It's it's formed on priority training, stop the killing, stop the dying, rapid casualty evacuation. The Lakewood Police Department. The, our training is we have continuous continuous training and we are evolving constantly with active shooter training since the watershed incident at the Columbine High School in 1999. The lessons learned from this tragedy resulted in us training to form small teams and engage in a and engage the suspects as soon as possible. Our training and tactics have greatly evolved since then. By 2012, recognizing that every second counts, we began training our school resource officers to immediately deploy, not waiting for backup. This training was delivered department-wide by 2014. This embraces the fact that the sooner we engage the suspects, the sooner we stop the killing. This is, uh, this is also a measure of support and understanding of how important a school resource officer is because they are in fact trained the same way. And they are right there on the ground floor when something like this goes off. You hope that they're there and they can pick up the red flag notices before something like this happens, but they are the first responder at a school where they're stationed. The, uh, we provided department-wide training on breaching, breaking down doors and windows, working while wearing gas masks, and working both inside and outside buildings. The Jefferson County Regional Academy provides all new recruits with basic active training response training. So they come out of, the, out of training initially. This is already part of the curriculum. So... As you can see on the slide, I don't like to read off the slide if I don't have to, but um, obviously the big components with the Lakewood mission is confront immediately. Agents are trained, we're trained continuously, and then rapid casualty evacuation. Once you address the shooter, this is important to understand, they, the officers going in to engage the shooter will not attend to the wounded. They have to continue to the shooter because while you attend to the wounded, obviously more victims are shot at. So we understand that and we deal with it and as devastating it is for both the officer and the people involved, we have to get to the shooter first. That's the primary mission. Uh, next slide, please. Chief Smith, can I add something real, real quick? I think oh, it's I'm important sorry. for the- Absolutely, Jeff, I'm sorry. I'd love for the committee to hear that um, we have an R1 armed patrol team uh, in Jeffco and every one of them are trained uh, very similar to our law enforcement partners through first response, through the alert, through the raid and the single officer response training. So our armed individuals are also trained to be first responders should there be an active event. And I think the most important piece is the partnership we share with all of our entities to include Lakewood is that we train together. 
And so if there ever is an, an issue, we, we go in with a unified command system and our team will partner up with Lakewood or any other resource that's there and go in and have the same tactical training that our law enforcement partners have. And I think that's important for you to know that that partnership is there. We share it and we share, uh, once again, if there is an issue, we share the breadth of what needs to happen um, to confront that individual. And if I might add, another good thing is uh, some of your bad actors are aware of that team. So uh, yes. it's a deterrent. It's very, it's a very nice thing to have, and we're lucky to have that luxury. On uh, this slide, slide six is uh, obviously it's the equipment we have. Um, these are supplied to all officers. We have the ballistic helmets, trauma kits, door access tools. You can read the the slide as well. In 1999, just emphasize that they we started training as small teams. They're usually set up like an arrowhead. There's somebody in the back block uh, protecting their flank and two of them are moving forward and they're catching the corners and or else trying to seek out the shooter. SRO is immediate deployment. As I said before, they're trained in um, all the officers are trained in door and window breaching and inside and outside scenarios. And 2014, immediate deployment training agency wide and Jefferson County Regional Academy recruits taught basic shooter response. The. Uh, Oh, slide seven, please. Unless you, Jeff, do you have something to kick into that one? I would just add that uh, when it looks, you see Jeffco schools, we have a, a a lot of these equipment and training for all our all of our armed officers as well. And we also conduct the tabletop exercises. It's a mandatory safety training for all administrators and they go through an active event. We show them what's it gonna look like should there be an active event all the way down to tabletopping, you know, an upset parent, et cetera. So we take them all the way through the gamut to make sure they're prepared should that event come their way. Slide seven, please. This is a very important slide. This is the teamwork. Um, anytime a school shooting is in place or an active shooter and we have innocent victims that are in the in the uh, the line of fire, it's all hands on deck. And as you can see by this slide, these are the ones we have active agreements with and train with Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, West Metro Fire, of course, Wheat Ridge Police Department, and then we have a, there's a command level training rescue task force operations, and that's across. I'll get into that. And then the Denver U, uh, UASI Urban Area Security Initiative, which was done in 2016. These are huge operations um, that Lakewood has taken has taken part in. The one I wanted to point to you is two, 2019 was 200 plus participants. It involved the SWAT team, bomb team, flight for night, life incident. Two two hospitals are involved. And this led to our own commander, John Alish, doing national presentations. He's done a presentation at the FBI Academy, and I believe he's also been at IACP. So we are a serious actor in this. We are prepared for it. We do not take it lightly. Um, I believe that that other one that happened so close to home, and there's even a memorial for the uh, Lakewood SWAT team in Columbine. Mm -hmm. But it just lets you know that the extent and that it's constant and it's taken serious and we're at an elite level here. Uh, Jeff, anything you want to add to this one? No, good there. So let's go to slide eight. Slide eight is the conclusion. And as you can see, the Lakewood Police Department creates the training, the tactics and the equipment needed based on test practices. The incident happening so close to home will always leave this burning in our training and as a, as a background and a foundation for how serious we take it. I like to use the line that you take your training so serious you take it you you take it you give the training the perspective that your life may depend on it or someone else's may and that's how you should address that's how you should address your training um again not so long ago we had a tragedy in belmar it was an active shooter and we had a, a lady uh, lakewood officer here an agent who's a hero and she saved lives because this individual was not going to stop um Finally, I just want to finish off with saying our agents and the people involved in the school, God bless you guys too, Jeff. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a teacher. But um, finally, our agents are true heroes and stand ready at our Lakewood community's behalf. And with that, I'm going to close our, uh, our presentation with a thank you. Thank you, Chief Smith and uh, Jeff for joining us this evening. 
Um, Council, do we have any questions, thoughts um, to our presenters? Madam Mayor, can I give you a preemptive question? Yes, please. What do I need? Now my city manager's cringing up there. We always need and appreciate the community of Lakewood's support. And officially, I prefer to make a professional presentation through the equitable and professional process that this community has allowed us to do. But all I want and all I ask for is, is the support that we continue to get. Thank you, Chief. I will add, as, as the mother of a student in a Jefferson County school, actually it's a senior in high school, and um, our much beloved, the home of our much beloved Detective Ezel. And, <laughs> you know, I honestly, I can't tell you all how, um, how much I trust as a parent, Jefferson County School Security Department and Lakewood PD, um, you guys have just always been so on top of, of you know, all the training, everything. I just, I, I've seen it evolve through the years and it's just amazing. I feel so, so fortunate to be in this district where safety and security is so important and all the way down to, I don't know, and Jeff, you may be able to say a few words to us about the DeAngelis Community Center, Safety Community Center. That plays a huge role too. I mean, it's, this county, it's not a badge of honor really to wear being the home of, of um, Columbine. However, it's really created an opportunity for you all to become um, such a, a stalwart of security and being able to share the knowledge that we've gained through throughout, honestly, the entire nation. Yeah, I will talk a little bit about the, uh, the amazing uh, Frank D'Angelo's Training Center for uh, Community Safety. The old Martinson building out in Wheat Ridge, uh, when it shut down, um, our department took it over and supported through Frank DeAngelis and created a training center for law enforcement to come and train in a school setting. And they do it for free. Um, they've got a grant that comes through the state, uh, the Department of Safety through the state, and they offer a grant to where we can train and bring individuals in. And we've had anywhere from uh, individuals across the metro area to countywide to FBI. We've had the Navy SEALs there, but it's just a unique opportunity to come and train in an active school and just train for that worst day <clears throat> there would be an event at the school. And it's amazing. We brought legislators and the governor through there and they've continued to support what we do. I think every quarter we bring a new group through there and just talk about the importance of school safety and the training facility in itself. And it's just great to be able to not only for our team to train there, but to bring law enforcement agencies from across the metro area and nationally to come in and really it's a one-of-a-kind training center and model to really help us get to the point where hopefully we never have to use the training but should we have to to use it we have a place to locate and, and really um perfect that craft so thank you i appreciate you bringing that up yeah thank you mr person um councilor labure thank you mayor and i i just want to jump in and say thanks to our chiefs for being here and for you know sharing uh, your thoughts on on where we are uh, as it relates to to school safety, and I hope you know you never want to be too comfortable, but I hope it gives some level of comfort to uh, the residents to to hear what you're all doing in terms of training and um, and um, thinking about uh, these issues. And uh, so I just want to thank you for that. Thanks for the presentation. I know uh, this will be you know um, well received in the community, I believe. And I also just want to uh, mention that. Um, you know, years ago, the council did uh, help out the, the police department by supporting, you know, new phones and body armor and new, uh, ar you know, vehicle to help you all out with uh, giving you more tools. And I want to keep that in mind for the future that, you know, if there's any tools or resources that uh, your department needs, we want to be here uh, thinking about that and making sure that you have what you need to do, you know, the job you need to do. And uh, just want to thank you again and uh, appreciate the uh, presentation. And thanks for coming. Councilor Over. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thanks, Chief. Um, I was the one to ask for you guys to come in. <laughs> and, um, and I asked, then um, the question I asked was, what are we doing that we don't get a Uvalde um, type of 
shooting, my massacre, really. And and it was it was nice seeing what you had, but you really didn't address Uvalde hardly at all. You talked about Columbine, and Uvalde came quite a long time after Columbine. And uh, there's a 575-page report out now from the Department of Justice, which lists a number of things that police departments should be doing, which I guess didn't happen there. Uh, and um, I just wanted to make sure you're incorporating all of that into your training and, and your planning and your discussions and things like that. Well, that's absolutely, Counselor. Um the um, every one of those instances provide a lesson. Unfortunately, um, you either have victories or you have lessons, and those are lessons. But um, it wouldn't be fair to comment on what goes on in that particular community. The um, I'm concerned about Lakewood, and um, we're doing what we need to do. As far as I'm concerned, uh, my experience. This uh, this is a very well run, well supported contemporary police agency in a very well-run, well-thought-of, mature community. And um, like I said, I've, I have read um, the majority of the report from that community, and they're not doing all the things that we do, but um, that can happen anywhere. That depends on the, you know, the, the training that you want to put into your, your police officers. It depends on how much you keep an eye on what's going on nationally. And Lakewood is headed in the right direction, and they're very well-founded. And the only reason I emphasize Columbine is because it's right next door. And how can you forget? Counselor, may I add something? Um, I, I think it's a, a fair question for us to address as a school district too. And I think it's important for you to know that uh, we read that report as well. And I used plenty of that information in there to ensure that we as a school district took what happened at Uvalde and made sure it didn't happen on our watch again. Those door checks I talked about, um, the individuals that watch those doors, we've mitigated how many mm -hmm. egress and entry points in our schools that our schools get to use. We've mitigated the opportunity for a visitor to just show up at a door and be able to enter those doors. We do frequent door checks. There are a lot of things internal that we saw in that report that really said a lot to us as a school district say what can we do internally you know before law enforcement has to make their way to us to ensure that we don't get to that point so um i i just wanted to reassure you that we took that very serious as a school district and implemented some some tactics and things from our lens that hopefully will keep and mitigate that from happening anywhere in jeffco schools counselor low Thank you so much for coming in and, and uh, doing this presentation, Chief Smith and, and uh, Chief Pearson. This is incredibly helpful, and I, I, I'm i glad Councillor Over asked for this. I think I think this is an important, really important issue. And I, I do just want to echo some of what's already been said. Um, my cousin lives in Lakewood. I have a very small niece and nephew in, in Lakewood. I know it's something, it's 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 literally the stuff that, you know, they, um, they have nightmares about. Uh, and so the work and that, that you all do and the fact that um, so many sworn officers in Lakewood are willing to put their lives on the line to keep our families safe is unbelievably appreciated and um, really heroic. So first, thank you um, to all the folks that, that work for you for, for doing that and for keeping us all safe. Um, I, I, I do want to actually push on the question that you volunteered, uh, Chief Smith, which is, I mean, other than, than continuing to do what we're doing, is there anything else that council might do or could do um, to support you all generally or or on this topic specifically. I, I do want to push on that. Um, I I also think Councillor Olver's point of, you know, sort of this th these key lessons learned, learned from Uvalde is, is a really important one. I'm glad that you've re reviewed the DOJ report. I mean, one of the key things I think I that you addressed in the report is this idea of, of, of having an incident command structure and working with other law enforcement agencies. Um, I think two other points that were made in the report are one, the importance of having a unified ICS. So, you know, it, it being very, very clear on, on who's in charge. Another point I believe was referenced in the report is sort of the redundancy of communications, right? I think, you know, some of the radios had failures that day. And so having sort of backup systems and backup to backup systems. So, are, I mean, are those, it sounds like the answer is yes, you've all looked at the report and you've thought about that, but are those two things that you've um, that you've looked at in terms of Lakewood's response. And finally, I, I saw a whole bunch of different partners listed on your slides. 
one thing I may well have missed it with the with the slides, but um, I, I I don't know that I saw Denver um, Denver police. I wonder if you all have have done drills with Denver police. Like, would they? I don't know. Perhaps some of this is confidential. If so, probably for good reason. But would Denver police be um, engaged in some sort of major crisis response like this or not? And if so, have you all drilled with them? And sorry, I know that was several questions. Um, I'm not sure. Well. I know we have a great relationship with Denver and they've I've had conversations with their commanders and so forth on different other events like they had the sporting events the championships over there and we were we were on the ready to go over and help out if we have to but you know we have you know we have to look after Lakewood too but yes in a in an all out call there is a mutual aid system between Denver and the city of Lakewood the um you, you referenced the incident command system. The incident command system doesn't kick in in an active shooter with the schools it, because that would be after the fact. The first thing is engagement. You set up your command post and everything else depending on who's there, but that's after the engagement has happened. You can't wait to set that up. You can't wait for somebody to take, to develop a lead, um, the perimeter or the command post. You have to get in the building and engage immediately. If it's a solo officer that shows up, they have to engage immediately. If it's several that arrive at the same time, that's a benefit, but they have to engage immediately. That's the tactics. The ICS system is based on perimeter staging and a command center, which is too slow for the active shooter process. And I don't know what other communities do, but I've known since 1999, that's not what you do in an active shooter, especially in a school, a mall, any pla a church, any place where there are victims, you have to engage immediately. Um, we have mutual aids. This, what's nice about the West Metro District is there are several entities all around us. And from what I saw, even at the Columbine incident and with the, uh, the um, shooting in Belmar, is every other entity does engage immediately. So that system is in play. The, uh, one of the confusing things where there's so many different uniforms at the Belmar incident. So we've addressed that with the communications and preemptive planning before that would happen again. But that's the only thing I heard on that is that guy was roaming and going from across the border. And so, yes, we were engaged. We, we you have to. Every, and, and everyone's that's the calling. Law enforcement is going to go. We're not worried about union rules. We're going to engage. That's what that's what we do it for. So. Counselor, I would add um, the communication piece from a school district. Right. So when you think about comms. Um, we are directly connected. Our 911 dispatch center that we have internal to Jeffco schools is directly connected to Jeffcom. And so when Jeffcom gets a call or we get a call, we see each other's notes, which, as Chief Smith reiterated, that response time and time is everything, right? Whether it's one officer showing up or multiple, that response time is key. So the fact that we're connected to 911 Jeffcom and we get the notes they do, we can have a much better response system when we get there, should there be an active event to engage, just like we would in support of, of Lakewood uh, law enforcement. All right. Well, thank you both again for coming in, Mr. Pearson. Thank you so much. I know this is not within your job <laughs> description, but we're very grateful that you came in tonight to share your wisdom and your experience with the school district. And Chief Smith, thank you likewise for being part of the conversation and bringing so much background with that. Um, with that, we will let you both move on to the rest of your evening. <laughs> And we will transition over to subject number two. Glad to do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Jeff. You. <laughs> Chief, see ya. Take care. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. So, Ms. Hodgson, I will hand the floor back over to you for introduction of our next speakers. Thank you, Mayor Strong. So, our next presentation is on traffic speed reduction and those recommendations from Public Works and the Police Department. So it's my pleasure to introduce Max Kirschbaum, who you know, who is our Public Works Director, and then he'll introduce the other speakers that will give the presentation um, with him. So with that, I'll pass it to Max. Hey, Ms. Hodson. Good evening, Mayor and Council. If you recall, in June of 2023, uh, many of you were not on council at that time, but uh, the Lakewood Advisory Commission presented uh, findings of its research related to speed 
and speed reduction. Many of the items that were presented on that evening are already in the Lakewood toolkit. We use them uh, regularly for purposes of traffic calming, speed control, and safety. A couple of them required uh, further and more in-depth study and some coordination. Uh, this evening, I'm joined by Mike Whitaker, who is our uh, city transportation engineer. And he's gonna talk with you about those two recommendation areas. And uh, our intent this evening would be to get your direction on both of these recommendations. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Mayor and Councilors. We'll get started here. Can we see the slides? Yep. Okay. I'm also joined here by uh, Division Chief Kester. So when we get to the question part, we'll have a couple people that can talk to you. Um, so a little background, um, looking at uh, residential speeds um, and looking at uh, Lakewood Speaks, I think there's a little bit of confusion I want to clear up. Um, the, the residential speed zone applies to local streets. Um, they don't apply to freeways, arterials, or collectors. Those are still done by engineering studies. So what we're talking about now is, is local streets um, in neighborhoods typically. So looking at our neighboring agencies, uh, Golden recently moved their speed limit to 20, so is Denver. Uh, Edgewater and Wheat Ridge are still 25. Uh, Jefferson County and Morrison are 25, and then a little bit further away from our borders, Arvada and Littleton are still at 30 as we are. Um, so this is just a map kind of showing you around our borders, you know, where the different speed limits are. Obviously with Jefferson County having some unincorporated islands within our overall boundary, um, it's a little tough for some of the residents. Um, but really want to talk a little bit about what changing the signs do. I think there's some misinformation out there. Uh, we talked about Boulder um, changing their speed limits about four years ago. I was recently at a conference and Devin mentioned that even four years after they've changed their speed limits, they're still only seeing a one to two mile per hour difference. People are not drastically changing the way they behave just because the speed limits has changed without any other, you know, specialized enforcement or redesigning of the roads, those things. Um, I also gave you a link to uh, Minnesota. They recently did a controlled study. So they looked at 20 two lane roads and they had other roads that they didn't change the speed limits on as a comparison. And they're all showing, you know, one to two mile an hour change at the most. Um, just like Boulder, they showed even, you know, a street would actually go up when people didn't think that it was uh, a reasonable speed limit. Um, so you get that reaction from from some roads as well. Um, this is what we talked about. <clears throat> um, on average, speeds are moving one to two miles an hour. Um, some, some speeds, you know, will go up. Um, what you're seeing is a little bit of variability. Um, as you move the speed limits down, some people probably move down with the speed limit, but other people are still driving the way they were. So we call that the variability in the speed limit, um, which is, is is usually not a good thing. Um, so yeah, so um, currently Lakewood is 30 miles an hour, which matches the Colorado law. Um, the LAC recommended that we move to 20 miles per hour. And uh, police and transportation engineering of uh, recommending 25 miles an hour for you, more to, to match what our uh, adjacent agencies to make things more consistent is, is where our recommendation is for them. Um, one thing to keep in mind is um, with traffic calming, if we move the, the the speed limit down, a lot of our traffic calming measures are done off of, you know, the average speed or whatever. So um, 
there could have an unintended effect that a lot of roads that wouldn't qualify for traffic calming in the past become qualified, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Depends on how many speed humps and other types of devices we want around the city. Um, but something to think when we when we look at changing speed limits is, um, you know, what are the unintended consequences? You know, obviously moving 25, if people don't change their driving behavior, you know, a certain percentage of our population are going to become, you know, what we would consider aggressive speeders or speeders where they really haven't changed anything. Um, we move the sign. So that's really the, the speed one. Um, the second point from the LAC uh, presentation wanted to get into is what Colorado calls automated vehicle identification systems. Most people call this photo radar or photo enforcement. Um, the typical things you'll you know see like red light cameras, speed photo radar systems all fall under this. So in, in 2022, um, the following cities below um, we're already doing this. And in 23, the state legislature modified the laws. And so these people are grandfathered in. And, and those of us that would be coming in later um, have a little different uh, requirements that we have to meet. Um, so the maximum penalty you can uh, impose for red light running through the Avis system is $75. Um, the maximum penalty for speed is 40 um, it does double in school zones um, to 80. Um, but prior to 23, you could only do speed enforcement in school zones, residential neighborhoods, a maintenance or construction zone, or along a street that borders a municipal park. Since we're trying to, to drive safety with these systems, you know, most of our fatalities are, are on our arterials and, and um, major collectors or freeways, but really they're on the arterials and, and the freeways for Lakewood for the most part. Um, however, in 23, the state legislature did uh, create a law or modify the law so that we're now able to uh, establish a safety corridor. We have to work with CDOT and the state patrol to establish safety corridors, but um, the city council can designate a certain section of street as, as a safety corridor. Um, we do have to illustrate through the data collected for over at least five years, you know, that you have an incidence of crashes, speeding, reckless driving, um, community complaints, um, those types of things to establish the street as a, as a traffic uh, corridor. And then there's some signing requirements. Um, 323 used to have to have a, a, a staff member with the, the unit that's no longer required. Um, but it's, it's still quite um, a process to get uh, Avis established. You know, you're going to hear it if you haven't already heard. You know, some residents are going to complain it's all about revenue and not about safety. I think when you start talking to a lot of the cities that are doing it, um, some things may be revenue neutral. But when you consider all the costs, usually it's still subsidized somewhat by the city. Um, and depending on what you're doing, um, will uh, show the level of subsidy that that event's doing, but we're doing it, you know, to increase the safety for everyone. Um, Aurora's been doing speed speed vans recently, you know, and, and like you would imagine, you know, they say basically when the vans are out there, people drive pretty good, so you don't get a lot of tickets. As soon as the vans are gone, you know, people drive the way they used to drive. So it returns to the previous pretty quick, unless you consistently you know, rotate the vans through and are out there quite a bit. So kind of what we heard from some of the people running it, that they think permanent sites, if we're really trying to drive safety, would be to do more permanent sites because they're always there, always enforcing. And um, you take out that randomization of people falling back to the way they used to drive. But with a permanent site, they're obviously signed. Lots of things that tell people that it's photo enforced. And so your your revenue on the ticket side is going to be down, which is what we want. Um, <clears throat> if we get into uh, the red light cameras, um, we'd be selecting them based on, you know, where our, our biggest problems with red light running are um, and the crash types and, and history and severity. So likely those are going to be like arterial, arterial 
intersections like, you know, Wadsworth, Alameda, Wadsworth, Colfax. Um, we would expect those are going to be, you know, higher speed roadways. You're going to have a lot more uh, serious bodily injury and fatal crashes at those types of intersections. So um, if we have the red light running at those locations, those are the ones we'd be suggesting. Um, just so for some information, at each intersection, you don't have to do all four approaches. Um, if you have certain problems with east-west streets, maybe you're running the red light, but not so much the north-south, you can just enforce the east-west. Um, it all depends on how um, the problem presents itself at each location. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of time. I know some people um, worry about <clears throat> uh, fairness in this system. So some agencies um, call it an infraction as soon as you cross the stop bar and it was red before you crossed the stop bar. Other agencies will use the crosswalk. Um, I believe Boulder is using what we call the curb extension. So you're already, you know, 15, 20 feet into the intersection before they use that line for enforcement. So it gives the, the driver the most leeway. Um, and so you're not trying to get that person that's just, you know, a tenth of a second um, after the red light. You're trying to get the, the egregious um Red light runners, which are the ones that cause the crashes usually. Um, so that was a, a best practice we learned. Um, <clears throat> right now, the LAC from their presentation, we're, we're kind of recommending three types of enforcement. You have the radar feedback signs is what I believe they were re requesting us to do, which we, we do already. Um, they did talk about automatic ticketing, uh, photo enforcement. And they also talked a little bit, for those that were on the council, about noise measuring. And I'm not sure. Um, we don't seem to have anything in the law that allows us to do automatic noise measuring ticketing. Um, so I'm not sure where their presentation was going with that one. Um, but obviously, it could measure noise. And if there were certain locations where noise were, were egregious, um, we could have an actual officer go out to those locations. Um, to deal with it. Um, everyone pretty much agrees red light cameras are effective. Um, they, they do drive change and they drive safety. Um, initially, you will see probably some increase in rear end crashes as some people decide to stop a little more aggressive than others. Um, but over time, that goes away. And um, the rear ends usually are not very um, serious crashes. It's the broadsides. Um, and approach turn crashes are usually where you have the, the serious injuries. Um, and so with our staff recommendations, um, we were talking about it'd be good to start with red light running. Um, probably try at least one in each ward to go around the city. Um, some of the systems out there now can also enforce speeds as well as red lights on those main roads. Um, but as I said, to, to do it on the roads where we really have the problems, the Wadsworths, the Kiplings, the Alamedas, the Colfaxes, um, we got to establish those safety corridors and, and go through a process, which you know I'm going to say is at least a six months to a year. And so starting the process with red light um, makes the most sense for us. Um, and with that, um, I believe we're ready for questions, unless Division Chief Kester wants to add anything. No, Mike, I think you covered it. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we will start our questions this evening with Councillor Stewart. Thank you, and thank you so much for bringing this back and uh, for your recommendations. Um, I know we're looking for some consensus here, so I will just start off uh, the bat by saying that I actually continue to lean towards being more supportive of reducing residential speed limits to the 20 versus the 25 uh, miles per hour. Um, you know, it, it may seem like a one or two miles per hour, but to a pedestrian or somebody on a bicycle, that could be the difference between serious bodily harm and, and death. And so that's, you know, something that I would 
still be supportive of would be going all the way down to, to 20, I think. Um, I am... What I hear more from my constituents is concerns about speed and less concerns about intersections. And I know that intersections are extraordinarily dangerous, um, but I am definitely interested in exploring at least pilots for starting to create those safety corridors. And to be honest with you, it is in my anecdotal experience as a representative in my ward, it, it is less people calling me to complain about Wadsworth and Alameda, which are both in Ward 3, and more people concerned about um, wide stretches of collector streets like Jewel and Mississippi. Um, that is really where the deep concern is because those are streets that are not state roads, there are people whose driveways um, and homes back almost directly out onto those streets. Those are streets where there are a lot of pedestrians. Mississippi has a bike lane and they're extraordinarily wide. So those are corridors that I would be more interested in exploring kind of the permanent um the permanent Avis installations on potentially, if we're going to be looking at permanent Avis installations, I would be less interested in roads like Alameda and, and Wadsworth and more interested in roads that have a lot more humans and children and bikers and pedestrians like Jewel and Mississippi. And I know I'm using Ward 3 roads because that's what I know and that's where I live. Um, but I do just want to highlight that. And so I'd be really um, interested in hearing what the processes for designating those roads, because really that's what I'm hearing people are concerned about. And so I want to make sure that the solutions that we are, um, you know, addressing are actually addressing the problems that we're hearing. And I'm hearing less about intersections. I realize intersections are very dangerous, but that's not the concern that I'm hearing from my residents. So if we're going to, you know, make investments, I would rather make them in places where I know that there are issues based on, you know, what my, my residents are calling me about pretty constantly. And I think it's pretty, I mean, the timing is really interesting of this presentation, given that really horrific um, crash that was on Jewel just a few, a few weeks ago. And also I want to highlight as well that I would continue to encourage us to try and use street design as a traffic calming mechanism. Um, I will highlight again, Mississippi, which has bicycle lanes, um, but a very wide center lane and like no tree canopy or anything. And so it just, it becomes this wide corridor. Um, same with Jewel, uh, with the lack of traffic lights in between Pierce and Depew, it just starts to become a, a highway. And so it would encourage us as we're talking about this to continue to implement um, smarter design that also, um, and we don't have to install traffic cameras. Thank you. Councilor Stewart, did you have a question in there? I thought my I only heard a question. Yeah, my only question, it was mostly a lot of comments, um, but my only question was, how do we go about starting those safety corridor designations? Thank you. So uh, we have to coordinate with CDOT and CSP. Um, they're looking, they don't give us any thresholds in the law, but they're looking for those locations where we have data support the safety de desire for that roadway. Um, you know, obviously, um, Jewel has has some issues. Um, Mississippi is going to be harder to find some of those data points that they're looking for. But complaints are one of the data points they're looking for. But yeah, they haven't given us, you know, a specific threshold that you have to meet. So it's just part of that coordination and throwing work coordinating with, with CDOT and CSP and obviously our police department. Thank you, Mr. Winnegar. Um, Councilor or Mayor Pro Tem Sharazai. 
Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Whitaker, for this great presentation. I know that a lot of us have been really eager to see staff's response to the LAC uh, great research that we saw last June. Um, <clears throat> so I, my, I'm going to ask a question I think Councilor Stewart was also curious about. It's just I'd like to understand better why the recommendation at 25 and not 20, particularly since we're flanked by Golden and Denver, who both are at 20. So that would be my first question. And then, uh, again, reinforcing a point that Councilor Stewart just made is I, I think you know, what the original proposal was and what we're hearing from LAC was a lot of recommendations on speed reduction. And I appreciate the um, the recommendation on the AVIS systems that are red light focused. But I do think uh, on your last slide, you have a bullet that says that there's an option for those red light cameras that can also be speed monitoring. And I think, you know, in an effort to accomplish what we're hoping to do. And if, you know, there's research, and I imagine that's why you all are making that recommendation that red lights are, are um, you know, an issue in running them. But I wondered if we, if there's a way to just prioritize the equipment that can do accomplish both those things. And then my last question is, you made a comment about traffic calming measures. Some new streets may be eligible when previously not with a reduction. And and I just want to make sure I understand, does the they still have to meet the same benchmark? So they would still have to get 90% of people to like sign off on a speed bump and they'd have to share in that expense. Do those things change if they're on if the uh rating system of the road that they're on um downshifts. I'm not sure what the right phrasing is for that, but I want to just make sure, like, does the metrics for uh, getting those installations change? Okay. Um, why not 20? Um, I think from our standpoint, um, or at least I'll speak for myself, I don't think it's a good policy to make most of our citizens outlaws. What we're seeing when you change the sign, if you're at 30, you're going to get people doing 28 at, at the best outcome that we've seen around the region. So if we're, if we're saying the speed limit's 20, you know, those people are getting very close to being the ones that are going to get pulled over and ticketed um, consistently um, just because we changed the speed limit, which, you know, if that's how we want to drive change, it's one way to do it, but you're going to, you're going to make a lot of people um, have problems with, the, with, the, with the law without really knowing that they've, they've changed anything. Um, there are equipment that will do speed as well as red light cameras. Um, we were kind of proposing red light cameras as a way to step into this endeavor and provide us that six months to a year that we think it's going to take to work with CDOT and CSP to define traffic corridors. Um, and then we'd, we could step in to, to speed if, if council was happy with the way the systems were operating at that point, but um, we'll go whichever direction, you know, we're given. Um, as far as traffic calming, um, the participation doesn't change, but the first part of, of that is we usually go out and do a traffic study of the road. And so if the average speed is less than the posted speed, it's usually not eligible. But if we move that posted speed down, even though nothing's changed, it all of a sudden that road becomes eligible. Um, and so, you know, the, the city gets that 90-10 um, Uh, process. I mean, more roads become eligible, but yeah. Um, but the threshold for the partition and all that doesn't change, but the, a lot more roads would become eligible just because we changed the posting so a lot more streets would be above that level. And hopefully Great. I answered those questions. Yeah, uh, Mike, this is Max Kirschbaum. Um, if, could I interject here for just a moment, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and ask Division Chief Kester to also comment on this question because I think that shift from 30 to 25 to 20, the big issue here is- I think is, Max is talking, but I can't hear him. 
and others here? I can yeah, hear you. Yeah, we can hear you, Max. Okay. I, th I think uh, the big issue as you go from 30 to 25 to 20 is um, it's not a straight line with enforcement either. And I, I do think there's an enforcement component here that it would be good to hear from PD. Yes, absolutely. That's significant of a shift and talking with neighboring jurisdictions who have made that shift and have found um, that it has not had the impact of change in the behaviors that was desired, along with uh, increased the frustrations within communities um, because there was a feeling that there's the speed limit is 20 miles an hour. The speeds are not, the behaviors are not changing to that because it is drastic to go from 30 to 20 and the police department is unable to, to simply sit in locations and enforce the 20 mile an hour speed limit zones in those locations um, or focusing on school zones and that type of thing. But that has been one of the challenges with many of the neighboring jurisdictions. In fact, several have changed from their 20 miles an hour to switch to 25 miles an hour because there was such a disruption in um, behaviors and that it, that it wasn't getting the outcome that was desired. So it, it's what we would like to have people driving 20 miles an hour. The reality is um, that's not the outcome when we change the speed to 20 miles an hour. Most people will reduce their speed by a couple miles an hour, which is closer to the 25, but they do not switch it to 20 miles an hour. And then along with the red light camera discussion and versus the speed enforcement, the red light cameras have, have shown historically and with a lot of research that there's a 40% reduction in those intersections that the red light cameras are in with those who run the red lights. The speed enforcement vehicles, they have not demonstrated uh, longstanding changes in behavior and it has not demonstrated that there is ongoing behavior change. And that's one of those things that we are, are looking for when we're talking about safety. And so that has been one of the reasons that we're trying to focus a little bit on the red lights that um, is more tangible and because there is limitations with the, sp the speed enforcement and there are certain legislative mandates that how fast or how slow those those red light cam or those speed enforcement cameras can be. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. It does. And I, just one more point of context. You know, we, we've talked a little bit and you all have referenced asking our neighbors and our partners. I just looked it up and Denver passed that law in May 2020. 23. So it feels like the data set may be a little tiny right now because they still need a time to implement. So I would just, you know, encourage folks to think about like, how long does it take to change behavior? I've been trying to work out and set a routine for 50 years, it feels like. So I would just add that context. Counselor over. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I applaud the uh, our reality-based thought process on this one. I, I really liked that at the beginning when you you were mentioning um, Boulder, uh, and re, and you mentioned something about uh, it's not a people think it's not a reasonable limit, and so then they just go, well, I'm not going to pay any attention to any limit whatsoever. And and I can get that. That makes a lot of sense. And I can see a lot of people taking that thought. Um, and so going to 20. I remember when this first came up, I tried to drive around my neighborhood at 20 miles an hour and it is dog slow. It you, you you don't get anywhere. And I'm sure the vast majority of people will ignore it. Uh, and so a reasonable one, if you wanted to go to 25, I'd leave it at 30. I'm perfectly fine with that. Since we're only talking about the residential streets, um, the little ones, not, I, I would think that Jewel and Mississippi are, I don't know, I'll have to ask you, Mike, is Jewel and Mississippi have posted speed limits? So that's something like, yeah, so then this wouldn't even affect those. But but I did have a couple of questions. Um, on the Avis corridors, can we establish them on state roads like, like Wadsworth? Yeah, we just got to coordinate with, with um, CDOT and State Patrol, and if they're supportive, then um, they might be the ones okay. that establish it. But but right. we could help lead that conversation for sure. Yeah, I was 
I would think that those are the places that we would need something like that. And, and I'm a little unclear. Are we planning? Is it in the works right now to install some red light cameras? Or are we just talking about maybe possibly? Uh, we're looking for council direction to come back with um, whatever we think we're getting for a consensus out of tonight. Okay. And in that case, I, I'm, I'm for it. Um, I, I definitely have had speeding tickets from those. <laughs> I remember Broadway and Sixth Avenue for sure. And uh, always looking around there and slowing down ever since that one ticket. Um, as for the traffic, okay, so that was all my questions. As for traffic calming, I also call those bicycle death traps. As you know, I'm a big bicycling proponent. Um, you know, if, if you want traffic calming, we have to think that through um, and not do something like that 20th on 20th Street west of Sims. That is a bicycle death trap. And I've shown it a couple of pictures of that a couple of times. Also, Garrison just north of Alameda is a bicycle death trap. And so, you know, those are two places where we spent a bunch of money for traffic calming. And, well, maybe the traffic's calmer, but it's definitely a heck of a lot more dangerous for bicycles now. Um, let's see. As for the auto pedestrian collisions and reducing the speed limit so that they can survive or pedestrians can survive that. Yeah, that that's a shame. Um I don't really know what to say on this one, except that hopefully maybe we can teach people to not walk in front of cars first before we have everybody in Lakewood slow down and take, you know, increase their uh, commute times. I mean, my my goal, I think I said this before I got elected and and uh, I'd be so happy if we could increase the amount or decrease the amount of time somebody spends from like say Sixth and Sims to uh, Alameda and Jewel by 10 seconds. That would be, you know, one person. I mean, if you add up that, as many people like that as, you know, there are as many cars that travel that as you can think of, that's, that's a huge saving of energy, time, stress. Uh, it's, it makes us, it uses less energy, uh, gas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not worried about the pedestrian. You know, well, I can't say I'm not worried about auto pedestrian uh, collisions, but I'm not willing to give up um, the ability to get where you want to go eventually, you know, in, in a reasonable amount of time um, for that. That was about all I have at the moment. Um, but so thanks a lot for the presentation. Councillor Lowe. Thank you, Mayor Strom. Um, and thanks for the presentation, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, I, I really want to want to emphatically underscore what Councillor Stewart said, um, at least speaking for Ward 3, this is a huge issue. Um, I, I, you know, I knocked on a lot of doors uh, in uh, over 2023, and I talked to a lot of people in Ward 3 who sort of volunteered this as something that was top of mind for them, um, specifically on concerns about, you know, speed and car racing and, you know, the, a lot of a lot of these these uh, uh, corridors that Councillor Stewart mentioned, Jewel, Pierce, Mississippi, um, were, were referenced as, you know, uh, uh, places where cars go too fast. Um, places where people had died or had almost died. Councillor Stewart referenced, uh, we had a really tragic death of, you know, an, a, a, an older gentleman in our community um, on on Jewel Street, uh, you know, that was that was caused among, and I know Mr. Whitaker, it's on your radar. I know you've been responding to a number of folks that have, have raised concern. Thank you for, for sort of helping spread, you know, helping share good information on that. Um, and I know there were a bunch of cause of that, but, you know, uh, and I don't want to suggest that that, that, you know, that one tragedy of, um, that that all of this would have prevented that, but um, but I think it points to this systemic issue of we do have cars going too fast, and residents are noticing. We've got a lot of residents that are living on these streets, and they're worried, and you know pedestrians are crossing these streets, and they feel unsafe. So I 
I, I really think we should take this, uh, and I, I think we are, but I think we should take these recommendations very seriously. Um, whether it's 20 or 25, I'm very much for reducing the residential speed limit. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think overwhelmingly commutes are, the, the time of commutes is, 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 is driven by congestion on main corridors, which isn't really what we're talking about. This question of whether a speed limit is 25 or 30 or 20 on a residential street, I don't think is going to add that much to, 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 to commute length. Um, setting that aside, um, in the briefing materials, uh, you all shared helpful information on SB 23, um, I think it's a 23200, um, this new state legislation governing Avis uh, uh, regulation. Well, so one thing, I know, there seems to be an assumption in, in your recommendations that we would have to establish one of these corridors. But if you look at the category of, of, of the buckets of things where we're permitted to do speed enforcement AVIS systems, it lists within a residential area, well, with quote, within a residential neighborhood as, as something that does not require establishing this corridor. And I, I guess it hinges on what the definition of residential neighborhood is. So Mr. Whitaker, maybe you can illuminate that. But, I, but my question is, it seems like some of the streets that Councilor Stewart and I are mentioning are clearly residential neighborhoods. So could one or some of those streets be, be areas for a pilot that wouldn't require going through this six month or one year corridor designation process? My understanding, we'll have to get with um, probably the attorneys and, and that, but uh, a street like Jewel that's an arterial was not allowed pre-23. Um, and they haven't changed that part other than to allow the, the traffic safety corridor. So my understanding currently is that we would have to coordinate with CDOT and the CSP to establish a corridor for an arterial. But again, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of certain blocks on West Mississippi or South Pierce, for instance, that are, that are clearly flanked on both sides entirely by residential. So, uh, I mean, I, I hear I me mean, maybe I guess it hinges on what the definition of arterial versus quote residential neighborhood. But I mean, the sort of the plain English definition to me of some of these stretches of road are residential neighborhoods. And and I, I frankly do see them as excellent cases to potentially pilot an Avis enforcement for to try to reduce speed. Um, so I, are we sure that those don't wouldn't count as a quote residential neighborhood? The Mississippi's might. But I think the problem is going to be finding the data that supports making it a a, a traffic safety corridor. Lots again, of it doesn't right. have the crashes to support it. But again, twenty three two hundred lists. It says um, uh, state, county, city, or Correct. municipality can issue a notice of violation uh, for an automated vehicle identification system um, if it happens in a school zone or residential neighborhood or within a maintenance construction zone, and then it lists it, or by municipal park, or along an area that's been designated by a, by a corridor. So I, I get, my question is just, could we could we maybe for a couple of these stretches of street, if we can establish that it is really a residential neighborhood, would that short circuit the need to establish a quote residential corridor? It possibly could, um, you know, we've kind of looked at it as we were gonna try to do these things to drive change where we're having the problems. And so we look at more from crash status, but um, one of the one of the the thresholds in there is number of complaints. So we could also look at those streets that we've had excessive number of complaints about speeding, um, even if there's not the crash data. My my point is just if if it in fact true is true that there might be a couple of of, of areas that would be appropriate for Avis enforcement that don't require establishing a residential corridor, then sort of the, the, the worry of, well, we've got to do this one year process uh, doesn't hold up, right? And and so we we could in fact pilot Avis speed enforcement um, in one or two areas. In one of the, in, in the briefing, the point was made, um, that the, the briefings did, materials didn't say, we're definitely sure that um, that Avis enforcement can't pay for itself, and here's why. They sort of said, well, we think maybe it won't pay for itself. Uh, and I, 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 pre, you know, I, I, I appreciate sort of not, you know, we don't want to be definitive if, if we're, we're not sure either way or if the evidence points in different directions. But, and I, I realize, you know, it, it seems like there's a perfectly strong argument that from the state legislation, um, 
it may actually be harder to collect revenue for all sorts of good reasons. I mean, the state legislation put in place a series of safeguards, which you summarized. But why are we are we sure that that a sort of a well constructed pilot um, Avis enforcement in one or two corridors wouldn't pay for itself. I'm totally open to being persuaded that that's the case, but I guess I would want to see some evidence of that. The agencies we've talked to say they're not paying for themselves, that they're being subsidized, but I don't know how they set up their corridors. I don't know how they set up their programs. They're just saying that their speed enforcement is subsidized by, you know, the city. Right. It's not self-sustaining. And is that what is that that's that's sort of the city's listed in the briefing materials? Denver, Golden, et cetera. Uh, Boulder, Aurora. Um, I think there's four or five that uh, Sergeant Barefoot spoke with. And if I can jump in um, across every to include Pueblo and all the jurisdictions that we spoke with, specifically around the speed enforcement, um, each agency discussed challenges. Aurora actually is, um, their pilot program has struggled significantly and they're pulling their, their speed enforcement pilot program and they have their own, own piece of their puzzle. Some of the challenges that did come up focusing around the speed enforcement and putting the temporary vehicles in terms of such as like the neighborhood areas is there's a quarter may be deemed, hey, this is a great spot for speed enforcement. But with you get neighborhoods, there's also challenges of where do you set up the vehicle so that it's also not blocking driveways, it's not parked on sidewalks, that there are significant limitations that were found and have been discovered of. It's not as easy to put out a speed enforcement vehicle and, and as one might think. Um, it doesn't mean it's not possible, but each area requires some significant study to ensure that we're also not creating traffic hazards in the process and limiting access to either driveways, sidewalks, um, and then that visual. And because in neighborhoods and residential areas, there are significant conflict points with, with driveways and sidewalks and, and stop signs, et cetera. So it does create, each site does requ require a study to ensure that uh, it is enforceable and it is a location that can be set up and, and is safe. Um, because ultimately, safety is what we're trying to accomplish throughout our, our whole process. Um, but so far, the all the jurisdictions have talked about significant funding challenges surrounding this the speed enforcement, which again doesn't mean that it's it's not a that's not our decision to make. But those have been some of those additional challenges that have been brought up. Thank you, Chief Coaster, and thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I, just. One other question. Um, I mean, is it not possible that we could use technology to some, some, solve some of those problems? I'm obviously very much not a, a, an expert on AVIS systems, so I totally defer to you. But for instance, if we're already deploying an AVIS system attached to a, um, a big light, a, a red light, could is there a way that that could double as sort of a speed enforcement in a couple of select corridors? Is there a way that that could work? Um, I guess what I'm getting, so that, that's one question. I guess what I'm getting at is, I, I I gotta say, based on what I've heard in my ward, I think there are a lot of residents that would really like to at least try piloting Avis as a speed enforcement tool. I mean, to your point, I think reducing speed limit to thir from 30 to 25 is one thing, but there needs to be some enforcement. Now, obviously, to your point, Chief, um, if we want that to be effective, so deploying it, spending money and having it not actually slow people down doesn't do any good. But I, I guess I would like to see a little bit more um, of a sense of what would it look like to deploy this? Is it technologically feasible on a couple of the corridors where there's a real need? Again, is there a way to do it in a residential area that wouldn't require the corridor establishment? Could we do it without deploying a van? Could we do it with an, a more permanent way where it would actually start to deter folks? Um, I, I th these are sort of questions that were raised, but um, I would be very much for kind of exploring seriously the feasibility of doing it on a couple of these corridors. So I wonder if you could respond to this sort of technology question at all. I'll stop asking annoying questions. And Mike, I could take the technology if you okay. want. Um, there are various different uh, systems in terms of this Avis system that from the temporary setups to there are permanent. Uh, there is one we have, we have not researched it entirely yet. We were waiting for some council direction that can do multiple things. It, it can do red light enforcement and it can also do speed enforcement. And that would obviously, it would be on a fixed location 
and uh, those are not movable. Uh, it requires some some studies and some making sure that we're putting them in the right locations and we're catching the right direction of traffic. But there is some technology that has advanced, it's relatively new, but that that has a three system uh, prong. So there is some technology opportunities out there as well. Thank you. Well, I, I would be for trying to, to to look at the feasibility of deploying this um, and at least piloting it. And I and I do frankly think there's a couple of corridors, as, as you've heard from Councillor Stewart and I, um, in Ward 3 where it could be appropriate. But I had a comment on the cost, maybe for the purpose of receiving direction from Council this evening on what our next steps might be in terms of developing budget, coming back to you for supplemental budget, coming back to you for code changes and the like, I think it would be safe to assume that we cannot determine or we cannot properly advise you that these would be revenue neutral or revenue positive. I think it would be a better choice on your part to assume that they are not going to be revenue neutral and there is a cost. And so that when we're making, when you're making such a, a, a direction, we understand that it's not for the purpose of breaking even or better. Heard. Thank you, Mr. Kirschbaum. Thank you. We have, um, we'll go Councillor LeBure, Councillor Mayor Guerrero, and then Councillor Cruz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, to, to our police chief, could, could you just um, tell me the difference, like hypothetically, if I'm driving in the neighborhood and the speed limit is now 20 miles an hour, what the ticket difference might be if I'm driving 30 miles an hour? versus if the speed limit was 25 miles an hour and I was driving 30 miles an hour. Can you just kind of break that down a little bit? And and if you have this answer, if you could tell me a little bit about what the outcome usually looks like. Uh, you know, do I plead down if I'm driving 30 miles an hour and in a 20 mile an hour zone? Do I typically just pay the full price of the ticket or is that usually get plead down to something else a little lower? So you know, it ends up being sort of the first classification. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Uh, I do not have the information in terms of the, because it's not about the speed limit that dictates it. However, it depends on how fast someone is traveling within that. So if the speed limit is 20 and they are going 32 or 33 miles an hour, then they're 13 miles over the posted speed limit. If the speed limit is 25 and they're same thing, then we're looking at eight miles over the speed limit. So the the summonses and the, the court's plea is not about what the, the baseline sp speed limit is. It's about the, the violation itself. I can't speak to the, the fines. I can speak to that the courts do have in depending on the violation, the, the option of plea a plea bargain sometimes it, there's an option of mailing something in however that's yeah, all very uh, there's a lot of information that goes into that and so each situation is not a standalone because it all really focuses on the violation and the significance of the violation and the, the history behind it thanks for that could maybe like i'm thinking about the range there so like if i'm doing you know one to five over it, it's probably a relatively low ticket, maybe no points versus if I'm doing, you know, five to or six to nine over or six to 10. I mean, can you speak to that at all? Like what that sort of fine difference is or the points might be? I can't speak to you about the fine difference. Uh, again, that's the, the court's piece in that puzzle. And I'll be honest, I don't even have to memory right now the differences in the point schedule because those get plead and changed so frequently. Okay, great. Thanks. And then, I should uh, clarify um, that with Avis, there are no points. It, it doesn't go on your record. It doesn't get passed to your insurance company. It's just a, a citation. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and Mike, I guess a question to you, really, Mr. Whitaker, is, you know, related to sort of calming measures, and it's a little different topic, but related to calming measures, you know, as a body, as a council, you know, which bucket do we put if we want to see a lot more or an increase in, in these sort of calming measures, 
you know, where do we put money? Because <laughs> that's what it's going to come down to is how do we fund that? So, we, you know, what bucket do we put that in that, you know, you would have the resources then to help do more calming measures? We pay for all that out of the traffic safety improvement fund. Um, pays for, Great. you know, all, all these types of um, systems. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. So I guess I would just say that I think one of the points I, I would just make is that I think the higher the speed, you know, the more uh, capacity you have, right, to enforce um, and, and help drive speeds down. So I think that that's really the reason why I would support the, the 20 mile an hour over the 25. Um, really, if you're, you know, only doing four or five over, honestly, you'll probably never get ridden a ticket ever. Um, but, you know, and that's not going to change your behavior. But if, you know, it's sort of egregious violation because you're speeding, you know, ex excessively, that's going to be, you know, a higher, a higher penalty. And I think that's the reason why it makes sense to sort of go for what you aspire to. If we aspire to people driving 20 miles an hour, we should say that. Uh, and make it clear that's sort of my perspective on it versus, uh, you know, just, just uh, doing things because that's what we think uh, people are going to do. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, the way I, I drive is I try to uh, drive the speed limit. <laughs> so what it's posted, that's what I try to aim for. Um, and sometimes I'm not perfect on that. But um, so, and then on the uh, red light and speed radar i think it would be great if we had a system that could do both um and i'd like to see that come to us and uh i'd be uh be willing to support that i will say mike on the on the decimal on the sound thing that the um lac was talking about it just took me back to years ago when we were talking about should we do decibel limits instead of uh, i think our law didn't have any decibel uh limitations um, I believe it was just sort of generally, uh, it said something sort of vague to, you know, not excessively loud or something like that. That's my assumption. I don't know. But I'd certainly be willing to take a look at that decibel uh, limit as well in terms of noise. But I know that's uh, for a different discussion. And the last thing I would say is, I think our major arterials are too fast. I know that's also not really this discussion, but, you know, you got 40 mile an hour speed limits, I think on a, on a, um, if I'm in a hurry, maybe I'm doing 45, but you know, if it was 35 or 30, maybe I'd be doing, uh, 35 or 40, you know, <laughs> if I'm in a hurry. So I, I think we should be looking at that. And frankly, I, I know I've heard some counselors say, you know, they're, they've heard a lot of the complaints in the neighborhoods, but I've also heard a lot of them on Wadsworth, people racing up and down Wadsworth. And frankly, um, I've seen a lot. So uh, to me, I'd like, you know, to take a look at those arterials as well. Um, but I'm just throwing that out there. So thanks. Councilor Miat Guerrero. Hi, I think that the um, majority of any questions that I have have certainly been answered by the very thorough inquisitive nature of, of our last few speakers. Um, I, again, as we're kind of looking for next steps, um, that I think in terms of, you know, uh, wanting to react to get details right, of course, but to me, I think with some of the answers about enforcement that Council LeBure was just asking, um, given the, the fact that we're in a region with other 20 mile an hour um, cities, uh, like our, our east-west roads are certainly touching them, Golden and Denver. Uh, to me, that is where to aim, um, except just to, to the point of like, if there's sort of a, an egregious consequence for as people are learning that. But I know it's also really considered the best practice in the like pro, pro pedestrian um, vision zero pedestrian death space. And so that would be where I would lean. I'm also not particularly a, a big fan of automated enforcement. Um, and I think in particular for me to be in favor of us, uh, increasing our investment in any of these types of automated enforcement that are actually enforceable, not just like the signs that are giving you your speed and whatever, um, that I would 
need a level of of detail in terms of like who is running that, who's then getting the data, how like what are we getting from that or not. And again, because it takes investment from us, like it's not something that's going to even be revenue neutral. Uh, I feel really doubtful that that's actually like worth it. Um, and I do agree that what I've been hearing about most is speeding both in residential and in some of these bigger places. And I want to echo and uplift something that Councillor Stewart said at the beginning of this conversation, which is that both the idea of potentially like the, the speeding reviews, reducing speed, but then also continuing to invest in traffic calming measures that include things uh, that can really elevate additional goals that we have as a city and how can we really double dip like with tree canopy um with more crosswalks with um you know improved bike infrastructure narrowing lanes things of that nature i think are also something that i would be interested in but in terms of reducing our residential speed as a place to start and then potentially increasing the amount of of uh speed like review signs that we see i'm very in favor Councillor Cruz, then Councillor Ryan, then Councillor Sink. Thank you. Yeah, echo a lot of my colleagues' gratitude for the presentation and circling back on this. I was in the audience when this was presented last year, so it's exciting to be on this side of the, the screen. <laughs> um, so I guess my first question, I know that in the LAC presentation and in some of the things folks were interested in, um, you mentioned that there are already like radar feedback signs. I'm just curious, like generally where are those or where, like what are the criteria for those to be placed? Because I'm guessing that part of why people might not know you're not, you're doing them is maybe they're not where some of these folks are. So just, I'm curious also um, how that program is going at this point in time. So most of them have been placed by citizen petition. Um, just like, um, Speed humps in a, in a local street. Um, it's essentially the same process for those collectors um, and um, arterials like Jewel, um, where people are, are seeing those issues. Um, and then occasionally, like Jewel by Pierce, um, we actually installed those signs on the police department's request um, just because they were out there so consistently trying to modify speeds and so occasionally we'll put in some some radar signs you know just based on feedback we're getting from uh, officers that are doing the enforcement um that you know that they're just continually out there and it doesn't seem to change very much um so we'll try to do something that's out there all the time but but yeah usually on the on the most most of the the sets of radar signs are in just by petitions from a resident Great. That's helpful. Thanks for sharing that. And for anybody listening, if you want a radar uh, feedback sign near you, check out that process. <laughs> um, and then I guess my other question, which maybe kind of speaks to some of my thoughts on this topic is like, what is like the, the difference in like cost and investment? I know you mentioned that a lot of the current traffic calming um, measures are already kind of, you know, within how you all work through kind of the public works budget. But like, what does like a program like a automatic vehicle enforcement cost versus like at those same types of intersections? You know, I mean, I know you all are already narrowing lanes and, and putting in some of those things, but I'm just like curious from like an investment perspective um, and like an evidence perspective, like what are the costs or benefits um, based on like this enforcement piece or some of this like design piece? Um. Division Chief Kester may have it in one of the, the background information, but I remember seeing, I believe, one of the agencies said they were paying, I believe, 8500 a month for the speed enforcement, Avis. Um, and I believe that was just at one location, but I could be wrong there, but I think it was just one location. Um, to give you a contrast, um, some of you have seen the island we put out at uh, Garrison and I believe it's Yukon, just north of Jewel. Um, that cost about fifty thousand dollars just for that median island for the pedestrian crosswalk. Um, we also put one down at uh, Bear Creek High School there at Dartmouth um, that 
had some bulb outs as well as the island, and that was about sixty thousand. Um, so unfortunately, construction costs have gone way up um, for some of those more physical concrete, which is why I think you see um, some cities like Denver, you know, really investing in the the flex hit posts and some of the cheaper infrastructure. Uh, we're about to put. Um, you know, some of that out on Garrison for uh, separated bike lanes, Denver West and Harlan. Um, we've got a few locations on Green Mountain, some of you know about, um, down Mansfield and Teller. So we're, we're getting that infrastructure out there a little bit um, that's a little more cost effective. But yeah, when you really get into the the concrete, you know, physical permanent type stuff, it's it's not cheap. Okay, that's, yeah, that's super helpful. And I think as we go down this further too, I would love to continue to hear updates or that or have this continue to be part of the conversation. Because to me, right, if, and I'd be curious if it was $8,500 a month for one spot or in general, I, right? Oh, go ahead. I can, uh, I can provide a little update. Uh, Mike, I'm very impressed with your memory. And uh, yes, the uh, one agency for one uh, van, the uh, rental is about $8,500. That does not include any of the staffing that is required to review each and every ticket and and provide the staffing input, but just to lease the equipment uh, for the vehicles is approximately eighty five hundred dollars. That's super helpful. Thank you, Division Chief, and thank you, thank Mr. You. Oh, sorry, are, are very similar as well. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. I can't see everybody's Zoom screen because I have the materials up on one side. So sorry for interrupting you. That's super helpful information. And I think with some of those costs, if that's just the van cost, um, I would really like for us to consider in whatever proposal we move forward, um, what an investment of that kind of size would look like in putting in some of these, um, whether they're concrete or other types of barriers that also really change people's behavior. Um, and at some of these sites, particularly if we're talking about some of these residential roads, which I know all across my district was one of the top concerns for folks. I know, you know, public safety brings a lot of my things to mind for people. Um, but and I think roads are really a part of that. Um, and I appreciate, you know, that a lot of what we're working on right now is data driven from a crash perspective. Um, and I, I also think that there is a quality of life issue in Lakewood right now where people are concerned about walking places, bringing their dog, their children, the safety of their you know children going places. And so for me, I, I definitely want us to continue to emphasize and, and get the word out about how people can make consumer complaints and how we can really treat you know pedestrian and bike dignity as part of um, our conversation on uh, quality of life in Lakewood, because I think that um, for me, <laughs> um, I will just echo the consent the what I'm hearing from some folks or add to the conversation that 20 feels like a very reasonable step forward for me. I have also <laughs> been practicing going 20 and sure it feels slow. Um, but in the moments, you know, I think part of what we're all talking about is we all make mistakes on the road or as pedestrians or as cyclists, right? What we're trying to make sure is that people are not um paying the ultimate price of their lives or extreme bodily injury, right, in those kinds of collisions and frankly, moving slower through our residential areas, which are not our arterials, which are not, you know, our collectors. That's part of that's, that's part of the point, right, is that we have um, a higher quality of life as a city by um, having streets that people feel safe moving around um, at all points of life, no matter whether they drive or not. And I think that that's huge for our climate goals as well. So I will just echo that I think um, continuing to think about how we um, incorporate this in our residential areas is important and would just add to some folks' emphasis on the arterials. I think particularly where there are um, intersections between our big arterials and transit corridors, like I'm thinking close to me on Wadsworth, you know, near the light rail, um, I, you know, don't know what the crash statistics are with pedestrians, but people are crossing super unsafely there all the time. And people going 50, 60 miles an hour is a recipe for disaster if it hasn't already created extreme disaster. So um, for me, it's a both and. And this is an investment that I think is really important um, that I heard really resoundingly from people in the community that was important. So I appreciate this conversation. I'm here for 20 and I'm here for kind of this expanding conversation around how our investments are actually going to uh, provoke the changes that we need in people's driving behavior. Councilor Ryan. 
thank you and i apologize in advance for the the background noise but i really appreciate this conversation like a lot of folks have said uh, one of the complaints that we've heard from many of our constituents is the idea of speeding and so how do you tackle that that uh, problem that from a public safety uh, and just frankly as as councilor cruz put pointed out a quality of life issue uh, as well and i really wanted to, uh, to touch on uh, councilor lowe's uh, question about technology so you were kind enough to remind us about the radar uh, speed signs that we have currently and i wanted to first start out with how effective do you believe those are when they are installed in, cha in changing behavior excuse me for the vast majority of people we do see it change um i think like anything if it's there you know years upon years um, some people are able to tune it out better than others, um, but we still see people adjust. One of the reports we get out of some of those um, systems, depending on the vendor, is um, their highest speed that it was in the detection zone, and then did they adjust their speed somewhere in that detection zone? And so you can see if they're reacting to, to something that's that's getting them to slow down. Um, I think where we are as a society right now, you have some people out there that are just aggressive speeders and um you know nothing seems to stop those and that's why we have you know, i think if you're more than five miles an hour over the posted speed limit we don't keep telling you what your speed is you know we just have a message like slow down um just because we don't want it to become sort of competition to see how high a number you can get on those signs yeah and, and thank you for that and i think you answered the, my second question which is it's my understanding a lot of those uh, radar signs uh, have the ability to collect data and it sounds like we are collecting some data and I'm curious to know what we're doing with that data in terms of uh, going to some of the questions uh, about whether something might qualify as a dangerous area based on the data that we've we've received or whether we should change the enforcement based on the data that we're seeing but I'm curious to know what what we're doing with that data and and whether staff is required to do that or if we have a third-party vendor who's having to analyze that data no, staff does it. Um, we do it more with, um, so we have permanent radar signs, and then we also have temporary signs that we rotate around the city that people can request. Um, the permanent ones, you know, have to, you know, go through that per, uh, petition process. You know, the, the speeds have to meet the thresholds to get a, a permanent set. Um, the temporary ones, you can just call and get on a list, and we rotate those around the city. Um, and those are the ones we typically are using for the data collection, um, just because we are moving them around the city and trying to see what's going on on the certain streets that people are complaining about. Um, and then there's a report in there, uh, an enforcement report that usually, if it's um, showing stuff that's that needs addressing, we'll send those over to the traffic unit and police so that they know about it. Um, and, you know, it gives them the times that most of the egregious um, speeds are happening. And so it helps them kind of focus where it, the times that they'd be best utilized at those locations. And, and then uh, just continuing on with our technology theme, is it, is it, uh, do we have the ability and would there be a cost savings if we had an automated speed ticketing system without having to deal, having to couple that with the red light uh, aspect to it? And would there be any benefit in terms of cost on that? Um, we haven't really got into the the cost for each individual type of component yet. Um, we can definitely uh, do that when we bring some of this stuff back. Um, but we've we've you know right now we've just got some anecdotal notes from from different agencies we've talked to, and I don't know if uh, Chief Kester has anything additional. No, I was going to say the same as we haven't done a, bit, a deep enough deep dive to determine the cost difference of the different technologies in combination with the staffing requirements in regards to fixed systems are on, on poles. They don't requ require a van or a vehicle. Um, is there a cost savings there? And, and we, so we haven't done that analysis as of yet. We are waiting for the um, guidance from, from council before we 
took that next step. And then my last question, if I may, uh, just having it once upon a time when I had more hair lived in another city that tried the red light cameras and uh, decided to abandon them because they did find a significant increase in rear end collisions with people concerned about stopping suddenly um, and uh, frankly, some vendor abuse. Uh, I'm just curious if you can shed any light on some of the comments as to whether that's been over time cleaned up uh, on our collisions. And it sounds like if we set it like Boulder does, maybe you avoid those types of issues rather than the hair trigger crossing a, uh, a quick line. The, I can say that different jurisdictions, um, someone like Boulder is actually continuing to add more cameras. Uh, most of the jurisdictions that we talked to talked highly of their red light cameras enforcement and said that those programs have been effective and productive uh, and have spoken just the opposite about their speed enforcement programs. Uh, they all said that those were the ones that have shown the least effectiveness in terms of overall uh, for safety. But again, it is um, regarding the vendors, we have not done a thorough research onto any vendor as of yet. So um, unsure referencing the vendor challenges that they might have had. We don't know, I don't know what that is, but we would do a deep dive on any, any vendor situations for sure. I, I will just say, I find all of this very encouraging. Uh, I think I would like uh, additional information before I'm ready to move forward one way or another on a particular system, uh, especially in light of the cost that could exceed, you know, $8,000 per per unit. And that was a temporary one that was shared. Uh, it sounds like there could be a lot of benefit. I uh, just think the council would, would uh, benefit from receiving more information from my perspective. But thank you very much for this presentation because I find it immensely helpful. Councilor Thank you. And of course, thank you for the presentation and all the councilor comments. Um, I remember hearing a comment that said, um, maybe we would install one Avis in each ward. And I think as next steps, what I would rather see is maybe a list of the intersections that are most problematic and um, install them according to that criteria. And so I don't know if when you come back to us, you'd be able to supply something like that to us. Anyway, that's, that's a comment. And um, I do have to claim ignorance on Avis. And I know on the second to the last slide, it said Avis LAC recommendations in the last bullet was noise measuring. And I know Councillor Labeer mentioned a decibel limit. And so what I don't know is, does Avis have the technology to give a decibel readout or how does that work? I'm sure there are systems out there that can give a decibel readout. I mean, I have a portable measuring one that I use for certain things, but I don't believe the state statute allows us to use a, a automated enforcement for that type of violation. Okay. I think it would have to be staff that would would have, would have to become involved. Great. Yeah, because as I was knocking on doors and, and what I've heard a lot is, especially in the summer, when our windows are open and the speeders are going uh, down 6th Avenue or wherever, Wadsworth, whatever, and um, the noise level. So I know not much was said on that, but maybe we could investigate that a little bit as well. And then lastly, hmm, 20 or 25 miles an hour. I'm really leaning towards 25 because then, then I'll go 23 or 24. And then, um, you know, if, if you set it at 20, I, I, I liked the comment. I, I believe it was Mr. Whitaker that said, we don't want to make criminals of our, of our citizens. And um, so 
I, I think 25 would be a good step down in years to come. We could always lower it again. It would be very difficult to put it at 20 right now and then say, oh, no, it's well, we can raise it to 25. That that wouldn't be um, very feasible. So I'm, I'm leaning towards 25 miles an hour. And that, that's all I have. Thanks. I... I can provide, I do know that Commander Buckin and the LAC have been doing additional conversations um, regarding noise. There's been numerous conversations that are that are surrounding the, the LAC right now with that conversation. Councilor Over, did you have another question? I did, and it's a question. Uh, and it kind of summarized, I think, what a lot of people have said in that you know, we don't get complaints about people doing 27 in a 25. We get complaints about people doing 50 in a 25. And so I was wondering, if Mike, if you could summarize what can we do about those, the speeders, the leadfoots, the, uh, the outliers, the aggressive drivers, I think you call them, um, and is is there anything we can do? Because that's the problem here. I don't I don't think anything else is the problem, but that is definitely a problem, and I hear about it all the time. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, in the Avis laws, um, up to twenty five miles an hour over the system still gives a ticket, but I believe if you're over twenty five miles an hour, usually an officer will deliver the the ticket, and so. I, um, I'd have to research a little more, but I think it goes into a different category um, for the response. Um, and well, I, was I think more it follows it with a, you know, a mandatory probably court appearance, I would assume. Right. That's if somebody gets caught. I, I was thinking more along the lines of our residential streets where there's not going to be Avis. There's not going to be much of anything else um, you know, outside of speed humps. Is there anything we can do? I mean, we, we have some other uh, interventions that we've talked about. You know, we've talked about bulb outs and median islands and narrowing the lanes and all that. Um, it's it's very expensive, you know. Um, and so um, it's kind of like, you know, not that many years ago, we were following the, the racer and groups that would congregate at certain big parking lots and then, you know, take off from there. I know. Uh, police have had their hands, you know, full in, in a lot of these types of aggressive speeding situations. Okay, thanks, Whit. Councilor Nystrom. Um, yeah, I, I'm just a little curious about if we can get a little more information on what um, areas have been designated as um, problematic or received a lot of complaints um, because I, I too heard a lot of complaints when I was uh, knocking on people's doors and, you know, I think a, a few years ago, a fantastic job of re-engineering the intersection at Jewel and, um, or uh, Wadsworth and Yale um, <laughs> probably prevented a lot of accidents because there were crashes there constantly. But, you know, when you head westbound on, Yale on any given day. Um, there are cyclists, there's older people trying to cross the streets, there's people walking dogs, and it's literally a racetrack. And I, I don't think I've ever actually seen a speed trap down there, but that might be an option. But I mean, it's residential, there's, there's a green space, and there's an elementary school. And I'm just bringing this up as an example, because I don't, I don't really, you know, want to go out and advocate for people to file complaints. But areas like that, if we don't have some data on it, then I think we need to collect it. Um, you know, and, and same thing, I think some people brought up different technology related questions at intersections. And obviously, you know, um, that intersection at Yale and Wadsworth remains a problem for people running the lights and speeding. Um, you know, but I, I guess I, I would be interested in a little more data on what is considered or where are the high complaint 
locations currently um, and, and you know how we could best maybe apply some of the suggestions um, and the studies that have been done um, but but I too think um, lowering the speed limit to 25 would be beneficial um, for a lot of reasons um, but I'm but I am curious about a little bit more about how we could apply the technology um, that might benefit uh, a lot of different intersections and streets. Uh, Yale is an example of another uh, item. We, we tried to intervene with speeds. Um, you probably, hopefully you haven't hit them too many times, but we have the, the shoulder rumble strips um, at the S curves there by the school. Um, cause people were speeding and going around those curves, um, not staying in their lane, which allowed them to go faster. So we put in those edge line rumble strips to try to keep them in their lane and slow them down. Um, that was, you know, directly, um, from complaints we had from residents that we tried that. Um, interestingly, probably unsurprisingly, right after we put them in, we did hear quite a bit of complaints from the neighbors about the noise they created as people drove over them. Um, but those seem to have gone down some, so I don't know if the people have just got used to the noise or if people are actually behaving a little bit better on those curves or a combination yeah. of both probably. Yeah. I, I, I still see a lot of speeding, especially during rush hour, obviously, um, on that particular road. But, um, again, that's just one example. Yep. So, thank you. That's a little nice from a forget aunt. Uh, this this might be a good point for me to add a general statement about some of the work that Mike's division does and in concert with police department. Um, the Lakewood Speaks, I'm sorry, not Lakewood Speaks, the Request Lakewood system, our, our service call system, uh, Mike receives hundreds and hundreds of comment on uh, Request Lakewood, a large number of those result in conduct of studies that Mike's staff carries out. And those might be uh, speed studies. Um, they might be traffic volume studies. They might be various measurements that allow us to evaluate each of the complaints that come in on that system according to the policies that have been set by council on what the thresholds are. Um, for something like a, a speed hump, for example. But um, I, I just want you to, to uh, be aware that the residents of our city are very active on that system. And it's, it's I, I don't, I, I think Mike uh, tracks numerically, but it's gotta be into the several hundreds a year that his staff evaluates. Thank you. And maybe not surprisingly, everybody thinks everybody else speeds. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kirschbaum. Okay, so we, um, this is where we get to do the hard work now. I'm gonna start, I feel like, well, there's at least two things that we need to decide upon tonight. One, the first question is um, the number of to which we reduce speeds in our residential street areas. Um, we have actually, I would say I've been keeping notes. Um, we have a tie, it appears uh, so far between 20 and 25. Um, Council Ryan did not mention on the record, but his preference was 25. So, and mine is also actually 25, didn't say that out loud. So with that, we've got four 25s and we've got four th or four 20s. And we have a few counselors that didn't say anything when you were, <laughs> when you were speaking. So um, I guess what I'd like to do, Councilor Shar, is I counselor over and Councilor low. The year of the three that I don't have a number down, could you just give me what your preference is if we were to pick a 20 or a 25 and we'll see if we can land on a majority? I'm a 30. 
Okay, thank you. I'm a 20. Um, I guess if forced to pick right now, I'm at 25. I honestly would, would like to see a little bit more research, not just in Colorado, but nationally to really assess this. But um, but given at, at the lack of that, I, I think I think let's reduce it to 25 to Councillor Singh's points and see see where that where that takes us. I think that's good progress. And I, I do agree reducing it to 20 is a very would is a very bold leap. So Mayor Pro Tem, you said 20, didn't you? I did because I encourage us to be bold. Low. There you go. Um, so I'm a little bit confused. Council Low, were you officially lodging at 25? 25, 25. Okay. So we have a very um, stark tie. I guess um, Ms. Hodgson, Mr. Kirschbaum, does this, is this something that would it be enough direction for you all if we just say we want more national data on the difference between 2025? Is that enough direction for this evening or how how might you maybe otherwise suggest? Perhaps if I could uh, answer that, if if what you, if your direction would be, uh, we would like more study, we'd like more analysis, we'd like more data, we, we can take that on as the project. If you were definitive about what you want uh, in terms of direction, our our next step would be then to develop a um, uh, the, the code changes that might be necessary, the costs that might be necessary, and come back to you with that specific recommendation. Um, we're we're okay with either way you want to go. If if what you want is more information we would take that as direction to go get more information. Councilor McGraw. I want us to really recognize that this moment is not actually decision-making, that this moment is let's get to a place where we have something to redline and decision-make, and that typically more information does come along with that. And so, I mean, if it moves us forward, like I'll switch to 25 and then I'll offer an amendment during on the on the dais to 20, right? Like I don't I don't actually really mind what's written in the first one because I will probably help to gather some of this information about why I think 20 is better and I'll send it to you all in that time. Um, and so I just, I do want us to not, I, I appreciate the level of detail that we're trying to get to this evening, but truly, I don't think that we actually have to have a hundred percent of the answers to these things to continue to answer them as we move forward in policy making, rather than preventing us from taking steps to make policy starting today on this issue that has really been bubbling up for many years. Ms. Hudson, Mayor Strong, can I interrupt? I, I really, I really agree with that, and I think that. Uh, we have enough information at this point that we can go forward and prepare the information for you. In the meantime, now, you all can have a more informed interaction with your constituents because you've heard from each other. You can always link this particular conversation in your in your correspondence with your constituents. And with that and the additional information that staff will provide, you know, I think we'll have a more informed decision when it comes to you. So whether we um, pencil that out as 20 or 25 or whatever, you can, like Councillor Matt Guerrero just said, you can then make those amendments on the floor and it'll be pretty simple because we'll have the rest of it all, um, all penned up for you, if you will. Okay, thank you. And so maybe what we land on is we've all collectively agreed we want to lower it to at least 20. Um, or I should say we haven't all collectively agreed, but the majority has agreed that we want to um, lower it to at least 25. And then gather more data. And on the evening that we go through, um, we will just determine whether 
folks feel more comfortable going down to 20. Does that feel clear enough for staff direction? Okay. Yeah, yes. yes, thanks. Mayor I Pro Tem Sharzai. Okay. And Councillor Lowe, do you still have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to like flag to that the LAC um, presentation wasn't included in tonight's um, um, links, yeah. but like for those who are saying they'd like more research, it's, it's a tremendous body of work. So I would encourage folks to go, go back to that June 3rd meeting. There are a thousand links in there that are two other research. Like part of this is we need to sort of take those steps because we know what staff's recommendation is. And some of us disagree with that, which is fine. That's where robust debate comes in. But just a reminder that there was, this conversation is predicated on a tremendous amount of research already. So encourage you all to like review that info. Thank you. Councillor Lowe? No, that's fifth. point taken, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. And I, I, I will go back and look at that because I, I wasn't on council when it was presented. I mean, I mean, just to put a fine point on this, my question, I mean, staff has kind of laid out the argument that, well, lowering it to 25 might, might have a very marginal impact and lowering it to 20 might actually have, do more harm than good, right? That was more or less what I understood staff's presentation to be. If, if I saw data that, that based on sort of careful studies, lowering speed limits to 20 in residential areas saved lives and and provably so and really did affect speed. Maybe the LAA, LAC presentation does that. I, I would actually be more inclined to say, let's let's reduce it to 20. So very open to that. Um, I, I would just like to see, you know, I, I think it's helpful that that our staff has looked at some other regional cities, but I, I, I can tell from sort of a, just a very quick scan that there are, there are academic, you know, rigorous national studies that have looked at this question. And I, I would just like, like to look at those a little bit more thoughtfully on, on this question. Councilor LeBeer. Yeah, I, I mean, I would also add that me knowing more about sort of the enforcement, you know, fines and strategies would also be informative to me and in sort of making these kind of determinations. I don't know what Lakewood's point system is or, or fine amount, but I do have an old Denver ticket book and I'm looking at theirs zero to five miles an hour over is zero points versus five to nine miles an hour is one point versus over 10 miles an hour is four points. So, you know, that kind of level of detail really kind of tells me in that situation, you know, I would want that um, sort of lower amount because it gives me more enforcement capacity, you know, to potentially find egregious speeders versus five to nine. It's a one point violation that tells me that, Really, I can speed five to nine and have pretty minimal consequences. And then under five miles an hour over, you know, really no, very little consequences. Um, so anyway, that's just something I'm thinking about when I think about this. But um, I like I like the direction we're moving. So just FYI, and certainly going to uh, read more. So appreciate uh, everyone uh, mentioning that as well, like looking at the old um, study session. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, so to get to maybe the more challenging part of it, um, can we see a raise of hands on how many people are interested in moving forward with red light camera? Understanding that we have time, and I do think the responsible thing for everybody to do is to speak to community and find out what thoughts are I will personally say that the complaints that I have received time and time again of more, more related to speed and um, more actual concerns with having red light cameras um, for a variety of reasons, including what was mentioned in Lakewood Speak. So um, let's start with, I'm, I'm breaking it up into two just to kind of do a, a, a litmus test on speed versus red and then we'll see if we can't figure out how we want to move forward there. So um, first one, who is interested in red light camera consideration? Sorry, point of clarification. Am I only voting once or what if I love both? We're doing separately. So you so only I'll do speed in a second. I 
So if you want red in there, if you want it wrapped in there, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. So we have, I think that was five. Rich, did you had your hand up? Red light? Yes. Okay. Glenda, did I see your hand up? Okay. So I think that was six all in. Ms. Hodgson, is that what you captured? No, I got five. I'm sorry. Sherzai. Sherzai, Labure, Nystrom, Low, Sinks, and Over. Got it. You're right. Okay. And then moving forward on the speed portion um, of our streets, not including red light camera in, who is interested in speed reduction? Tactics. One. I have nine. Councillor Cruz. Yeah, just wanted to to clarify to you, like in that speed reduction tactics, does that include? Kind of the conversation around the speed cameras and enforcement as well as potentially my personal um, interest in comparing like um, some of the and I think other folks like some of these traffic measures and everything is that like encompassing everything did I understand that correctly I think that's for us to determine okay because that's what my vote meant More like traffic calming, not necessarily a photo camera. Yeah, I um, I think with the information presented thus far, it does not. I don't feel super convinced of the cost benefit. Um, the the that would like benefit outwearing the cost of some of these automatic enforcement based on some of the conversations we've had about other measures of making uh, of reducing speed. Um, so I personally want more information and more detailed um, kind of comparisons of those. Um, and then also I think some folks brought up privacy and other types of concerns around um, the uh, automatic enforcement mechanism. So that that to me will inform all that decision i'm happy to be have it part of the conversation but i want to make sure that we're having a broader conversation than just the cameras so ms hodson and mr kirschbaum i don't know that we've provided a lot of clarity but maybe you feel like you know from here how you might move forward yeah Bob? yeah i actually think we're we're in pretty good shape that was a lot of hands that were just raised to, to be in favor of some kind of speed reduction. So that that helps us, that helps us move forward and to get some more uh, data and do some more research based on this conversation. And again, it'll, it's kind of the same structure as the red lights. Then we'll come back to you. In the meantime, you interact with your constituents as a result of this conversation. And then we'll have the structure put together for the um, the language, and you all then can decide if you want to accept or change, modify, et cetera. So I think we're in, I think we're in pretty good shape, um, and we we actually do have pretty good direction in terms of our next steps. And then you all, at the end of the day, get to vote and decide exactly exactly what you want this to look like in the for the future of Lakewood. Sound good? Perfect. Thank okay. you very much. Sure, of course. So I would say this is where it is very vital for us to work hard moving forward. Like this is definitely, I'm sure, not a surprise to any of you that these can be lightning rod topics. And it would, I highly behoove all of us to message this out as far and wide as humanly possible. I know we've got a number of ward meetings that are coming up. A number of you do newsletters, um, putting it out on social and all the things I think, you know, so that we don't get surprised last minute feedback because um, we've got a nice long runway on this. So I would ask that everybody work really hard to, to hear from your residents what their thoughts are. Um, you know, red light cameras, any camera camera can really um, be a, a heightened concern for folks. So please just 
do a lot to message out and ask the question. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and close the book on that topic. And before we adjourn our meeting this evening, I do have on um, the agenda for an open for our, well, I'm sorry, first of all, to our public works crew and Lakewood PD, um, I missed, oh, there we go, Division Chief Tester, thank you so much for being here, Mr. Whitaker and Mr. Kirschbaum for this um, presentation. Really appreciate your time, um, not only tonight, but in getting all of this together. So thank you so much for joining us. And we'll go ahead and transition over to committee reports. Do you have any committees that wish to make a report this evening? All right, uh, Councilor Stewart. Thank you. I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that the Budget and Audit Board have finally met for our first quarter meeting. It was a fantastic opportunity to catch our three brand new members up on all of the work that the board's been doing for the last couple of years on um, you know, the, the future outlook of the city budget and the sustainability of our long-term, um, you know, income and revenue sources as a city. So was really excited to have that meeting and catch everybody up. Um, and uh, we have a consultant who came in who is going to be um, doing a community survey that's going to be put out uh, this later this month. So we're engaging on that process and uh, excited to hear the results and those will be uh, shared with council. I just want to give everybody a heads up um, that these conversations about the future uh, funding and sustainable funding for the city are, are conversations that we will be having as a board this year and we will be bringing um, those conversations to the city council as well as future recommendations potentially but just want to give everybody a heads up that we are working really hard to loop the whole council in on this process uh, at various points uh, in uh, various junctures so stay tuned stay tuned for opportunities to please engage with us on this process as we move forward councilor cruz Yes, just wanted to uh, provide a brief update on Legislative Committee since we are um, quite a bit of a way through session at this point. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, uh, many thanks to Mr. Goldstein and staff for all of their work and helping us understand this flurry of, <laughs> of bills. I think there's over 616 bills um, that have been introduced this year, um, and we have talked about many of them. Um, and so I can briefly just like run through some of the bills that we've been looking at, but also if you ever have any questions, um, I know, or just reach out. Um, I know some other folks sit on other groups um, or are involved in the community in other ways and want to know what our positions are on things. So feel free to ask. Um, but essentially the, the bills that we, that we have been tracking um, so far, um, we're in a supportive position on um, 1098 cause required for eviction of residential tenants. Um, judicial review of local land use decisions, um, local government authority to regulate pesticides, um, vulnerable road user protection enterprise, although that bill has sadly died, um, and uh, safe housing for residential tenants. Um, we are in an oppose unless amended position on one bill, that's um, uh, HB 241168, equal access to public meetings. Um, and then we are in a strongly opposed position on one bill currently, which is um, HB 24-1304, minimum parking requirements. Um, we're monitoring a couple of other bills, um, including 1152, accessory dwelling units, um, and uh, SB 24106, right to remedy construction defects, which I know has been um, a, a ripe topic of conversation on council and other groups. So I know we'll continue to discuss that bill. So also say, uh, we are continuing to figure out how all of these pieces will impact us in Lakewood and um, share our voice as is appropriate. And many thanks to staff and understanding how many of the bills that are coming down the pike um, are impacting us. Thank you, Councillor Sinks. 
So the Head Start Committee met March 18th, and we approved their annual report. It is quite extensive based on the guidelines and the federal requirements for Head Start. And as you remember, um, we voted that, yes, they would continue into their fifth year, I believe fifth year of their contract. And then we still have that decision out there, what will happen after this last year. And uh, so we'll be considering that in the future. Um, I think they can stick... I think the director continues to have some staffing issues. It's again, very difficult to hire those, um, those workers. And we will of course meet again, although I don't have that date in my calendar yet, but um, just wanted to give that report. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Mayak Guerrero. The HPC having policy commission continues to um, essentially work through creating some recommendations to full council for different items in the strategic housing plan um, that we believe essentially need a path of like research and learning that likely the committee and or one of our like LAC or planning commissions, et cetera, um, would want to take on versus things that seem like uh, are in a little bit more of a space where driving towards a specific policy, like an actual ordinance change is, is kind of the phase that we're in um, where we could start to as a full council to talk about, learn about, consider things. So um, that is something that we'll be prepared to have better conversation at our housing workshop in May. Um, when we're talking about the strategic housing plan as a full body, we will have some of those, some consensus around sort of how we think we can break down some of the, the more important um, more pressing components out of that plan. Thank you. All right, with that, we will go ahead and call it a night. So I adjourn this meeting at uh, 9.24 p.m. Thank you.